Several lessons back, we learned about black children who are taught in their schools how to code switch between African American English and Standard American English. And having learned in today's lesson about different dialects, each of which encompass systematically different vocabulary and accents and grammatical constructions, we can see now, looking back at that previous lesson, that African American English is really its own dialect of English, no different, linguistically speaking, from a, or then a British dialect or an Australian dialect. British people say things that sound grammatically incorrect to us, such as, we went to hospital, or be sure and study your maths. But these constructions are correct within that dialect. In Scottish English, the plural of cow isn't cows, it's kai. The plural of shoe isn't shoes, it's shoon. Scottish people count ain, twa, three, four, five, six, seven, oct, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. They say bairn instead of child, kirk instead of church, big instead of build, I instead of yes. And I could go on, there's tons and tons of examples of these kinds of things. But you can see that not only do they have a different accent, but they have different vocabulary and different grammatical structures. In the same way, African American English has a unique set of words and non-random set of grammatical constructions that might feel incorrect to a speaker of standard American English, but are correct within that dialect. For instance, a black person might say, he nice or he running, but they would not say, I nice or I running, because African American English isn't broken or filled with random mistakes. The grammatical constructions have, in fact, evolved in systematic ways over time. I want you to think about it like this. How do you know that it's correct to say, we were going to the store, rather than, we was going to the store? You only trust that the first way is correct, because when you were young, your parents, and later your teachers in school, modeled the grammar of your dialect for you, and if you made mistakes, they would interject and correct you. It's only correct, then, to say it, we were going to the store, because that's how people of your dialect speak. But dialects change over time, and the old ways don't always stay correct. So let me just talk about this for a second. There's something called a language change index that rates grammatical usage on a scale from one to five. Stage one is for misspellings or mistakes that are generally rejected by almost all users. Stage two is for usages that have spread to more people, but are still considered non-standard. Stage three items are commonplace among many well-educated people, but are still avoided in careful usage. An example of this would be like, I better, uh, I better do this instead of I had better. Um, you, you might hear I better and not even be that critical, but if somebody's being careful, they will recognize that the correct construction is I had better. Stages four and five are where the rules really change. Stage four items are widely used by almost everyone except a few linguistic stalwarts. An example of this would be like how we used to have to say whom in certain contexts, but now almost everyone drops the whom uh, in almost all contexts and just says who. But there are some linguistic stalwarts who are still really fixated on keeping the grammatical construction of whom in sentences where it's appropriate. Um, and a stage five item is fully accepted by everyone except a few eccentrics. So these are things that used to be grammatical errors. They started out as misspellings or mistakes, and they spread gradually and became more and more commonplace until eventually they became fully accepted by everyone in a society. Let me show you some examples of these stage five changes. I'm going to show you the old correct versions and the new correct versions of several different kinds of sentences. 
So it used to be correct to say none of them is mine, because none was a singular noun. But now we say none of them are mine, because we're using the are to refer to them instead of none. We used to have to say a number of students was absent because we were talking about a number as the noun, and that's a singular noun, so we would have to say was. However, today we say a number of students were absent because we're using the word students uh, uh, later in the sentence, and so we use a plural uh, verb in the form of uh, were to refer to this plural students. A student was graduated from college. Why? Because it used to be considered that the word graduated was something that only the college could do. The college was doing this verb to the student. Only the college could graduate somebody. Now we construct the sentence to say that students graduate from college. The student themselves is doing the graduating. It used to be only correct to say the reason we took this trip. You could not say the reason why we took this trip. It, the word why would be considered redundant because by saying reason, you would already have indicated that you were about to explain a reason, the, the why of the sentence. And so you didn't have to say why. In fact, it was unacceptable to interject this word why, but now it's completely standard. It used to be that people would uh, only use the word hopefully to mean in a hopeful manner, like she stared at the roulette wheel in a hopeful manner, or hopefully. But now we use it to mean, I am hopeful. So, uh, as, a, as a first person uh, uh, construction, so we would say, hopefully I won't lose all the money. But this word does not mean, in a hopeful manner, I won't lose all the money. What we mean is to say, I am hopeful that. This was not an acceptable construction in the past, but today is completely standard. It used to be correct to say he dived into the pool, but we've formed a new past tense verb, dove, he dove into the pool, and now this is a correct way of wording it. I was on the bus one day, um, this was several years ago, maybe nearly 10 years ago, commuting to work. And I overheard a black child telling something to his mom. He said, we were going, and his mother interrupted and said, we was going. This might seem really, really uh, problematic from your perspective, depending on your socioeconomic and cultural background. However, this young child was learning the correct grammar for his dialect, the language that was spoken in his community from his mom. And later, when he was in school, his black teachers would likely model similar constructions, like we was going. So if everyone in this little boy's community speaks like this, how are constructions like we was going or he running any different from you saying a grammatically incorrect sentence like he dove into the pool? instead of what really technically used to be the correct in your dialect, he dived into the pool. I mean, think about it. From a strictly linguistic perspective, it's exactly the same. The only difference is we denigrate people for speaking the African-American dialect, but we accept the British dialect, the Australian dialect, the New Zealand dialect, the South African dialect as viable versions of English for biased reasons that are related to things like socioeconomic privilege and national history, but a subculture like African Americans with a unique and largely independent history isolated from the dominant surrounding white culture can be expected to evolve a unique form of English, a unique dialect, by the same mechanisms that any other form of English comes about, which is quite simply, through norms. So for that reason, I argue that African American English is, is completely linguistically ordinary. There's nothing wrong with it. It's, it's not filled with mistakes. It's filled with differences in the same way that Scottish English is filled with differences and British English is filled with differences. And different areas around the country, we have different accents. Different dialects just evolve in different trajectories, and black uh, African-American English is no different.